The Dodgers beat the White Sox yesterday. Well, it was the Dodger game also early spring, spring training. training. It's not even spring now. Well, still, <laughs> spring training. They it's beat them seven to six. This is good. This is good. It doesn't count, but it's still good. <laughs> Well, you got a long way to go to October. Yeah. <laughs> Baseball season is a good thing. Um, the author of Ecclesiastes writes, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. And that makes us uncomfortable because we'd like to be in control and like to think that if we make good choices, then the things will turn out well. And life just doesn't always work that way. Um, that is, if you make good choices, it improves your odds, but there's no guarantees. Monday night, Brittany and I were driving home after dropping one of her friends off, and we're going down. Um, 20th Street, yeah, 20th Street West, approaching Avenue J, and I'm within a second or so of reaching the intersection, light is green, it's been green for a while, some other cars have gone through, all of a sudden the BMW goes zip, right in front of us. Freaked Brittany out terribly, she screams we could have been killed. I was so annoyed I almost used my horn. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't blow. We are not in control. Now, Monday turned out not to be a good day to die, but it, uh, we came within about a second and a half, I suppose. We are not in control because whether we live or die, it's time and chance. As Proverbs puts it, in their hearts humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. That's Proverbs 16.9. And the psalmist put it this way, uh, let's see, Psalm 139, 16, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So, Monday was not the end. So you get to listen to me today. Um, in the short, hmm? I said yay. Yeah. yeah, in the short letters that we saw at the beginning of the book of Revelation, chapter two and three, one of the things you'll notice is that each of those churches was suffering persecution. Things are not going well for them. And in fact, for the church as a whole, for the first generation, times were really hard. But things did not go well at all for the Christians, didn't go well for the Jewish people during that period of time either. Um, and then this week, we come to the second half of Revelation chapter 7. In chapter 6, uh, we met those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. That's Revelation 6, 9. Uh, Jesus promised his disciples early on, uh, at the very beginning, uh, John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world you will have trouble. And John 15, 18 through 21, he told his disciples, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who has sent me. So things are not going to go well for the church, and of course the church has suffered persecution through its whole history. Uh, in chapter seven, first, verse, first eight verses list 144,000. They are listed by 12 tribes, each tribe having 12,000 people in it. One might think that the number is very precise. Just like, you know, in the modern world, all numbers are precise, right? If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, the football game has two minutes left in it. That means I can set my watch, 120 seconds from now, the game's over, right? <laughs> no, probably not. Um, 
crowd estimates and political rallies always accurate, right? <laughs> no. We know better. In um, Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, you have this. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, some translations say 70 times seven, which would be 490 times. So does this mean when we get to, you know, your friend has bothered you 469 times, or 489 times? <laughs> and so you give them the one um, minute warning. <laughs> you know, Joe, I'm really sorry. I've forgiven you of this problem 489 times. If you do it one more time, that'll be the last time I can forgive you. After that, I'm going to have to kill you. Just want you to know. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. That's not the point of the number there. Uh, numbers are not always precise. And so when you think of the 144,000, that's a rather artificial sounding number. And what we're going to find is that today we're looking at the second half of chapter 7 and it talks about the multitude. It's the same group that we had in the first half of the chapter. So we'll look at that. So today's passage, Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, continues the Russian nesting ball effect, the Matryoshka effect. That is, chapter 7 is inside of chapter 6, which was inside of chapter 5, and so it's going to go. So, Chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. This is today's passage. <coughs> After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house once again this week. I ask that you bless our time together. Bless us as we go through this passage. Help us understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, it begins again with the after this, which means that this vision comes after the previous vision, not necessarily that this is an event separate from or later than uh, the earlier event. And as I said, the group of 144,000 in the first passage is the same group here. The picture that we're getting is of a restored Israel, uh, the true Israel, whose salvation is dependent upon what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, it's an innumerable group, those who've been saved from every tribe, nation, people, tongue. Same phrase, that phrase, uh, nation, tribe, people, tongue. We see it repeatedly in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapters three through seven, you'll see that phrase showing up repeatedly. John is using that on purpose. Remember, the Old Testament plays a large role in informing and in the language of Revelation. Now, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, describe this group. Uh, it says, um, let's see, we 
Uh, see, and they sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And so the great multitude that no one can number here in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9 evokes the promise to Abraham. Abraham and Jacob were both promised that they would have nations come from them and that it would be innumerable. Uh, Genesis 32, 12, um, God promises, but you have said, I will surely make you prosper, and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. And the same promise is given repeatedly to the patriarchs and to the Israelites, um, both in Exodus and Numbers. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, verses 25 through 27, you get this. You'll speak against the Most High and oppress His holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into His hands for a time, times and half a time. But the court will sit and His power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey Him. The, multitude, the multitudes of chapter 7, verse 9, are the innumerable true Israelite descendants of Abraham. In Genesis 22, 13 through 18, got to keep opening all these boxes and going through all the different passages so you can see this. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And at the end, uh, verse 17, after Isaac is rescued, says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now this combination of specific detailed numbers and then the idea that the numbers can't be counted is a format that we see not infrequently in the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 26, verse 51, first census of Israel, they are numbered tribe by tribe, and the total number in chapter 26, verse 51 is, see, the total number of the men of Israel was 601,730. Very nice, precise number. But then, not long after that, Moses tells them in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10, that time I said to you, you are too heavy a burden for me. The Lord your God has increased your numbers, so that today you are as numerous as the stars in the sky. There are more than 601,730 stars in the sky. Milky Way galaxy alone has about 400 billion, which is, I think, more than 601,730. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, in Numbers chapter 1, verse, uh, chapters 1 and 2, when they counted them, you had 603,550, but then by chapter 10, verse 36, it says the countless thousands of Israel. And so the pattern that we see here in Revelation, where you have 144,000 and then a multitude too high to number, perfectly normal, what we see happening repeatedly. Uh, so, in this passage you see the saints wearing white robes and you see them with palm branches. Uh, the palm branches is probably an allusion to the uh, Festival of Tabernacles. In the Old Testament that was a, an annual occasion of nat National Thanksgiving when they would remember the time they spent wandering in the wilderness for 40 years living in tents. Uh, and also thanking God for the crops and the commemoration of all that they had been through. Uh, so John now applies this imagery to peoples from all nations who rejoice in their latter-day exodus of redemption from all their oppression and their victory over their persecutors. 
Okay. Uh, verses 13 and 14. Then one of the elders said to me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the, the Lamb. So the identity of the group of people that are standing here, that are clothed in white robes and have the um, palm branches, where did they come from? Well, they're, where they came from is not a physical location. They came out of great distress. They came uh, not from some geographic location. And it's just as well that they're not coming from a geographic location. I think I've mentioned before that when we think in terms of eschatology, we think in terms of the second coming, we think in terms of a lot of things that we see in the Bible, we tend to have a very naive view of things. That is, when Jesus returns, you imagine seeing him uh, coming down, or the resurrection, people are popping up out of graves or out of the um, ocean. There's a certain complexity, though, to what will be involved in the Second Coming, particularly now in the 21st century. Since 1999, Eugene Shoemaker has been buried on the moon. And so he's not going to be popping up here. But then it gets worse. You have, uh, what's his name, Clyde Tombaugh, who's the guy that discovered Pluto. And when they sent the New Horizons probe to take pictures of Pluto, they put his ashes in it. So he's actually now in interstellar space. He's at more than a billion miles past Pluto now. They just went by Ultima Thule uh, on January 1st. So come the resurrection, it's a little bit more complicated than we might otherwise think. So the Christians, this uncountable multitude of people from all humanity, from all time, made up of all the tribes, nations, tongues. Uh, they have come not from a common geographic location, but they have come from a common experience, the experiences of life, which is suffering. Now, the first answer is that these people have come from the Great Tribulation. Uh, some assume that the people are a select group who have been martyred for their faith because they have died during the Tribulation. But it's not clear that martyrdom is in mind. Um, the word that's translated Tribulation is the same word we saw back in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 16, verse 33 where Jesus told them, in this world you will have trouble. The word that's translated trouble is the same word, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Uh, the word trouble could also be translated simply as distress, problems, plumbing. Uh, <laughs> the Dodgers losing, which they didn't. Uh, trouble is the nature of being alive, that we are going to suffer. Those who have gone through the great distress, the trouble, the tribulation, the problems of life, however you want to describe it, these are Christians in general. They are described as those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> it is the work of Jesus that saves us, that brings us to this place where we are given the white robes. We all go through the great tribulation, which is another way of describing our lives. So, verses 15 through 17. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away their tears. The mention here of uh, they will serve him day and night in his temple is an interesting one. Now back in Revelation chapter uh, 5, 9 through 10, believers are made a priesthood as a result of having been loosed from their sins and being purchased by the blood of Jesus. Uh, 
In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 26 through 28, you have the image of the temple showing up there as well. And the imagery is similar to what we see here in Revelation. It says, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy, and my sanctuary is among them forever. So God says, I'll establish my sanctuary in their midst forever. The problem that we have is to start thinking in terms of a literal temple. Um, we shouldn't think of or understand this temple as a literal building made out of mortar and bricks and wood and such. And that becomes obvious after a moment's thought that it can't possibly be talking about a real physical temple. Consider what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well in reaction to her question about what was the right place to worship God. In John chapter 4, verses 21 through 24, Jesus tells her, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, elsewhere in the Bible, we see what is the temple of God now? It's us, our bodies. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person for God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Or 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is your temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have received from God? You are not your own. And then we get to what Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So again, he knows that Jewish people and Gentiles are brought together in one group. Same image that we see here in chapter 7 of Revelation where you have 144,000 and a great multitude from all tribes and nations all brought together. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, paralleling the picture of the city of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 21. That new Jerusalem has gates with the names of the 12 tribes on it. The foundations are the names of the 12 apostles. New Jerusalem is also described as the bride of Christ, a bride dressed for her husband in Revelation 21 2. The bride of Christ is who? It is us, not the building, but all of us together, the people of God. 
from Adam to Abraham, Jacob to Moses, the ancient Israelites, the prophets, the apostles, Christians then and now and on into the future, all believers everywhere, from every nation, tribe, and language. Remember the concept in Matthew chapter 18, where two or three are gathered together, there is God in their midst. We are now with God forever already because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. We stand already in the presence of God in his holy temple. We are part of the kingdom. <coughs> Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ, if indeed we share in the sufferings, in order that we may also share in his joy. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8, describing the new Jerusalem. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like a roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Revelation 21, 9 through 10, I saw the holy city of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Um, we are the temple of God. We are here forever. Our spirits in heaven always see the face of the Father in heaven. God lives in yesterday, he lives in today, he lives in tomorrow, he's not just everywhere, but every when. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so the fact that we die, you may wonder, well, how can we have everlasting life if we die? It's because... God sees us in our entirety. He sees our present, he sees our past, he sees our future. More than that, he lives in our past, our present, and our future. It's an eternal now from God's perspective. We never perish because we are never separated from the presence of God. Our spirits always stand before him. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, Jesus said, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels or their spirits in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. We worship God in spirit and in truth. We are always with him. As Paul put it in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither the height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have everlasting life. We are always and forever standing in the presence of God. We are always in God's temple because God lives inside of us. We are the temple. We have everlasting life. And our dead loved ones also have everlasting lasting life there with God as much now as then, as much as we are now or then. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we've had together this morning. We ask that you bless each person that's here. Thank you for all the things that you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen.